And the enemy's job is to try to get us to keep our mouth closed and not say anything. The devil doesn't want you to sing about Jesus. He doesn't want you to enter into worship because the devil isn't stupid. He knows that when a people will come together and have a made up mind and decide, I'm going to go into the house of God and I'm going to say something. I'm going to lift up my voice and I'm going to let people know that I love the Lord, that I come into the house of God to praise Him. And I don't care what you're doing on my right side or on my left side. If you're bothered, you just need to give me some room because I've come to pray.
Amen. Those monies are going to go to help the people that are going down there for this ministry to get there and get back. Amen. Amen. To help buy the shoes of, of what we're going to distribute. So all of that is for that. But if you're here today and you don't have any money, you'd like to just stick around for the fellowship and eat some good Mexican food, then stay with us. Amen. We don't want you to go because you can't afford to stay. That's not our heart. We want you to stay. Amen. And have fellowship with us. And so it's free for you if you have no money today. Amen. Catch us the next time you can, if you can. Amen. The only, the only thing I'd attach to that is don't let Pastor catch you down over uh, shopping at Kohl's. Amen. After you eat your free tacos. That is not what we're talking about. Amen. Saving your money for something else. Amen. Amen. So we just wanted to say that. That's a blessing. Uh, today is our last offering that we receive. We'll be sending out the monies that we uh, uh, have been gathered together for transportation for Luke Similar in Haiti. And so if you were going to be part of that, you have decided you're going to contribute that. And have not contributed yet, you still can. But I need to get that money off this week. We need contact with uh, our missionary in Haiti, Luke Similar, and we want to send him that money uh, to get his transportation going. So a lot of good things are going on. And I'm glad, amen, for outreach. I think we go outside the walls and have impact in our community, amen? Impact in our nation, impact in our world. That's what it's all about. Amen. So we're glad you're here. You are a big part of what God's plans are in the earth. And I want you to know that this morning. You are special, unique, and important to the kingdom of God. Amen. None of us are here by chance or by accident. God has a perfect plan and purpose for each and every one of our lives. You've got to know that today. Can I get a witness in the house of God this morning? Amen. You are not just somebody. Amen. You are someone special that God has anointing and plan and gifts in your life to be used to advance His kingdom to help somebody else find the Lord for themselves. Amen. And have purpose in the life to help somebody be better than they were before. Maybe reach out and pick somebody up that's down. God's got a purpose for you. And so you're important to God. And we're glad you are here this morning. You are not unnoticed by the Lord this morning. He sees you here this morning. And He's nodding yes. Yes. Amen. In your favor. God's favor is on your life. Yes. It's not in yes to you this morning. Amen. He's well pleased with your life. Has a great purpose and plan for your future. This morning, if you would, turn your Bibles to the book of St. Luke. Excuse me. St. John chapter 14. We're going to go back there. I think the last time I preached, I may have preached out of this chapter of Scripture. Uh, chap this chapter and these verses. But I'm going to look at something totally different than before. But this is a wonderful chapter. Of course, the whole Bible is wonderful. Got some good help on that side. I didn't hear too much on this side. The whole Bible is wonderful. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. Good, good. Amen. And so, the whole Bible is wonderful, but there's certain chapters in the Bible that I kind of favor and enjoy more than others, and this is one of those chapters. Chapter 14 is just so sweet. So, it's so personal. And, and I just get a sense and feel it a whole out of chapter 14 when Jesus is preparing his believers, his followers, he's preparing them for the future. He's preparing them to have hope for better days ahead. That's a good word right there. That's our God. He comes alongside of us. He comes with us. He comes and enters into our lives for the purpose of letting us know better days are ahead. And Jesus is here with his disciples and he's preparing them for hope that better days are in their future. That something good is coming. Something greater is on the way. I'm going to use a verse of scripture and we'll get there in a minute. About greater things. This is what Jesus held out to his disciples. He said, I'm going to go away and prepare a place for you, but I will come again and receive you to myself. Let's read it this morning. And then we'll pray. St. John 14, verse 1 says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Isn't that wonderful? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you will be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas said unto him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, and how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. 
No man comes unto the Father but by me. If you had known me, then you should have known my Father also. From, and from here on you will know him and have seen him. Philip said unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it will be sufficient for us. Jesus said unto him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. And how can you say, show us the Father? Do you believe that I am in the Father, the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself. But the Father that dwells in me, he does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Or else believe me for the very works sake. Truly, truly, I say to you, that he that believes on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. I'm going to stop right there and use the last portion of that 12th verse, where Jesus says, Greater works than these shall you do, because I go unto my Father. And I'm going to use this for a subject and a title today, that greater things are now. Greater things are now. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your presence in this place. In your presence there is fullness of joy. And at your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Lord, we thank you for the word of God that is quick and powerful and sharper than any two edges. Lord, it's a living word. And Lord, even though you spoke this word, 2,000 years ago, God is applicable and alive for us right now. Lord, I pray you bless these people. That you touch their hearts, their spirits, and draw them to a closer place with you. I pray this word, Lord God, would illuminate and enlighten them, Father. And acknowledge me, God, of what they have already been given. And use that to bring glory to your name. To be a blessing and help others, Lord God, to know you as well. This I pray, give you all the praise and glory for in Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen. Amen. The greater things are now. This verse of scripture has been a verse of scripture over the past several few years. Amen. They brought a lot of discussion and a lot of questions. And the question is that there is a promise of greater things to come. When are those greater things going to come? Some of you may have had that same discussion yourselves, and maybe even that question in your life. When are we going to see? the greater things. I've come to the church today to answer that question. I've come to give you what my answer is to that question. And I believe that the greater works that Jesus is talking about cannot be compared or thought of in the realm of signs and wonders. Think about it for a minute, amen. We love signs and wonders. Jesus said, I will confirm my word with signs and wonders to follow. We love to see the miraculous. We love to see the, the dynamic of the movement of the Spirit of God in the church. We love to see the tongues and interpretation of tongues. Amen. The gifts of miracles and healings and all of these things. But Jesus, amen, did a lot of these same things. And what is greater? How can you have a greater raising of someone from the dead? It is literally impossible. You cannot raise, raise some from the dead greater than they were raised from the dead before. It's just as good, but it is not greater. How can we uh, open the eyes of the blind in a greater way than Jesus opened the eyes of the blind? It is literally impossible to open the eyes of the blind in a greater way than Jesus opened the eyes of the blind. I'm going to tell you right now, it will make a believer out of someone real quick if they don't believe in God to see a miracle like that. I am not just counting miracles. I believe in miracles. I expect miracles. I have seen miracles. God has used me to perform miracles. I pray for miracles. But what I'm saying is any miracle that God does through our lives is no greater than the miracles that Jesus has already done. And so what is it that Jesus meant when he said greater works than these shall you do? Amen. The greater works then, they cannot really mean the quantity or the amount of work. Some people have reason, well, maybe Jesus meant it was the, the, the quantity because we would do more works. Well, the very word itself would discount that. Yes, if you do a careful study of this word greater that Jesus is talking about, it does not mean a quantity. Hello, somebody. It means a quality. The word is truth. Amen. It means a quality, something that is superior in value. Jesus said, the works that I do, greater shall you do, because I go to my Father. What Jesus was saying then was that when I go to heaven, I'm going to send the power of the Holy Spirit down for you, to live in you and be with you. And the greater work that you do will be something of greater value. 
than which I have already done. Amen. And so what is it then? What is it? I believe that what Jesus was saying was the greater works that we would do because he had gone to the Father is found in the verse itself. Look at it again. He says, greater works than these shall ye do because I go to the Father. How was Jesus going to the Father? He was going by way of the cross. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Jesus was pointing to the fact that when he went to the cross, died for our sins, went into the tomb, raised up on that third day, I'm alive forevermore. I was dead, but now I'm alive forevermore. He transferred the church into a position that they had never been before. Because the work of the cross was for us. But the way of the cross is administered by us. He said, now you are the light of the world. Now you are the salt of the earth. Let your works, let your good work be seen of men, that they may glorify your Father, amen, in heaven. And so I contend, and I suggest this morning what Jesus was talking about is the greater works that can be deposited in a person's life is something that was found after the cross. Oh, that's a good place to say praise the Lord. What was the cross all about? The cross was all about Jesus coming to seek and save the lost. The cross was all about an opportunity for somebody, me and you and all those that will hear the word of God, an opportunity to enter into eternal life. It is found in the golden text of the Bible, John 3. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have a miraculous healing. No. Would not perish but have their eyes, blinded eyes open. No. Would, would not perish but be able to rise up and walk. No. He said, he said, this is the gift. This is the greatest thing. Whosoever believeth in him would not perish but have everlasting life. I will submit to you today that we've been looking for something way out there. Something still to come. Something greater is on the way. And a lot of people have met with disappointment. I heard somebody say uh, this last couple of days was, if this is the manifestation of the sons of God, then I am disappointed. No, it's not a matter of God disappointing. It's a matter of that we haven't recognized what God was doing. He came into the world to give us a gift. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is what? Eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We've already got the gift been given to us. And he wants us to take it and share it with everybody else that we can. That is the greater work. That was not possible until after the cross. Can somebody say amen? Amen. And so the greater work is that we become conduits. We become distributors. We become ambassadors. We become people in that got something in us more than they had before the cross. We have eternal life flowing through our veins. And it's a really a reality. And it is a truth. The mission statement of Jesus' ministry goes from our text and ties perfectly with the reference of John 3.16. The greater work being able to give eternal life to those who will trust and obey Him. And so it becomes universal. It becomes a message that works anywhere you go in life. Hello, somewhere. Amen. 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 It's the same in America as it is in Africa. It's the same in Africa as it is in Haiti. It's the same in Haiti as it is in Mexico. What is the message? The message is that Jesus loved you. He was a he was God, robed in flesh. They came to live in this earth for 33 years. Went to a cross and poured out his blood so, and died for my sins and your sins. That if you will trust in the finished work of the cross. And on that third day, he got out of that place and he said, behold my hands. Put your hand in my side and see it is I. And you fall down on your knees and say, my Lord and my God. And that person can be saved. It works. Amen. It works. People begin to trust in the Lord, the message of the gospel, and they get saved. Amen. The steps to eternal life are so easy that many times we have to try to figure out and make it hard.
harder than it really is. Jesus simply said, Amen, if you believe, you will be saved. Yeah. Amen. To as many as receive him, it says in St. John 1.12, to as many as receive him, to them he gave the power. He gave the right yeah. to become the sons of God, even to those that believe on his name. To truly trust and believe in Jesus is not a matter of the mind. It is a matter of the heart or the spirit. Amen. We're living in a day and age and society and church life where we try to complicate things more than they need to be complicated. Somebody was trying to tell me some real deep things yesterday. And I, I, I study, I research. You guys would be amazed how much time I put into searching the things out that I search out. But that's not the point. God is doing my heart to back up and get Simplify everything. It's Jesus. Paul was a mighty man of God, somebody. Yeah. Amen. He was even had a PhD in theology. The man knew what he was talking about. Yeah. Amen. He was as touched the law of Pharisee, set at the feet of the greatest philosopher and teacher of theology of his day, Gabriel. He said, But I met Jesus on the road to Damascus. All of a sudden there's this bright light, a light came yeah. on, and I fell down on my feet. I was blinding my eyes. I said, and I heard a voice. Saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And I said, Lord, who are you? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. He said, Lord, what is it that you want for me to do? Amen. Amen. He didn't try to scratch his head and try to figure it out and try to get the EMC squared and, 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 and try to figure out what the dynamic of, of the possibility of that would be. And maybe it was just some type of, of illumination of the sun hitting off against these things and of a chemical reaction. No, don't get hung up and trying to figure everything out about God. My goodness, did you know that you have 50 trillion little genius molecules in your body? We would blow our minds trying to figure out God. How he created the body and the stars and the universe and all of these things that we contemplate and try to figure out. And we trip ourselves up. Well, if I could just figure out if there was a God. Forget that. Just realize, amen, that Jesus is real. He died on the cross for your sins. He rose again for your life. Trust in that. And come down to this altar and say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Let your love wash my sins away. And I guarantee you something will take place. Something will happen. Your life will change. You will be born again. Your life will be made new. How do you know? Why are you so confident? Because it happened to me. And it happened to many of you. How many of you have found that to be true in your life? Take a look around here. Take a look around. The songwriter tried to figure it out. He said, he said, something happened. He touched me. Something happened. He touched me. And all my life became new. He just touched me. I didn't know anything about the Bible. I didn't grow up in a Christian home. I wish I would have, but I didn't. I was a heathen. I didn't know anything. The only Christian song I knew was Joy to the World. That, that was as close as I got. But when I got to church, kind of like this, and the preacher was preaching kind of like this, and the opportunity was given kind of like this, I got up from my seat, I came down the altar, I bowed down my head, and I said, Jesus, forgive me of all my sins. And do you know what happened? I got up from that place, and it felt like a weight that was on my life was lifted away. I did not even know that it was there, but it was there. What was that weight? It was the weight of guilt and sin in my life that I did not even realize I had it, neither did you, but something happened. Only touched me and he made me new. I'm telling you today that if you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, you need to know him. You need to find him. You need to trust him. to accept Him. Amen. There's just too much about God. The more I know about God, the more I realize I need to know about God. You do not find out everything there is to know about God. The Scripture tells us He is past finding out. There is no searching of His understanding. We can't figure everything out 
about God, but we've got enough. And it's found in Jesus. He means that I am the way, the truth, and the life. Just come to me, and I will no wise reject you and cast you out. Amen. God made the creation of the universe and inner space and the forces all around us that it would take us a lifetime. As a matter of fact, it, we would exhaust our total lifetime. It's not enough time to try to figure everything out. So the Lord says, simplify. Just make it easy for me. Tell them Jesus loves you. He died for our sin. I was, I can guarantee you right now, I was just as messed up as the most messed up person in this place today. And we're all messed up. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and tell them, you're messed up. <laughs> you're messed up. <laughs> we're messed up people. Serving the gracious God. We're not perfect. A lot of people outside the church get tripped up on those Christians are always making mistakes. I thought you were a Christian. I thought you loved God. How can you do that? Because we are messed up. We make mistakes. We trip ourselves up. We say things wrong. We do things wrong. Thank God. We are saved by grace. We're saved by His love. He's the initiator of it. For God so loved that He gave first. He gave us a way to find Him through the person of His Son, Jesus Christ. But we've got to believe. He that comes to God must believe that He is. And that is the reward of them that diligently seek Him. I just want to encourage you today. Don't try to figure everything out about God. Just believe. Just come to these altars today and accept Him. He's the greatest asset, the greatest gift, the greatest experience anyone will ever have in their life is found in Jesus. Amen. There's a lot of great things that God has created in our world that we can enjoy. Relationships with each other. Beautiful things, the ocean, the mountains, the clouds, the flowers, a lot of beauty. In creation. The creation is below God. It declares His glory. Yes. Nature declares the glory of God. But our greatest asset is knowing Him. Amen. Our greatest experience is finding Jesus as our personal Savior. When you do that, I guarantee you, that sin that will be lifted away. You'll feel something on the inside like, how did that happen? Pastor Kim said that one. Yeah, I feel so light on the inside of it. I used to jump from this step to that step, but it hurts now. <laughs> Wisdom is another attribute that comes from God. <laughs> so we must believe it. We just accept that He is, and He's a rewarder then that diligently seek Him. And the second step is that we must experience Him. I can stand here all day long, trust me, I can preach for a long time. <laughs> but, but, but trying to explain to you the joy of salvation is like trying to explain to someone that's never had a strawberry ice cream cone what strawberry tastes like. You've experienced it for yourself. I can tell you what it's like. You can listen to what it's like. But you'll never truly know what it's like until you experience it for yourself. That's why God says, oh, taste and see. Amen. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good Amen. and His mercy endures forever. Amen. I invite you today, if you don't know Him, to find out for yourself. Surrender your life to the Lord. Ask Him to forgive you of your sins. Let eternal life come in. There's a great future ahead of us. And he wants to bless us and favor us now. And he will and he does. But in the days to come, Jesus said, I'm going to come back for those who have accepted my offer, for those who have embraced my truth. I'm going to come back and I'm going to take you back into a home called heaven that I prepared for you. So we've got to experience it. Jesus told Nicodemus, you guys remember Nicodemus. The Pharisee that came by night. I, I noted this last time, Nick by night. <laughs> he came by night and he said very simply, You 
you must be born again. And we, we trip up. We, we lose understanding. We don't know what God's talking about a lot of the time. Because we're trying to reason it in our natural mind. And God is a spirit. It's a spiritual experience, not a natural experience. Don't feel bad about that. Nicodemus, a Pharisee, had the same problem. He said, how can I be born again? How am I going to get back inside my mother's womb? It's impossible. Jesus. Of course it's impossible. Because he was speaking of a spiritual truth. He said, it's no, 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 no. It's not a natural thing to talk about. It's a spiritual thing. You must be born again. You have to trust in Jesus. You have to grab a hold of the truth that the Lord loves you. And I don't care who you are today. It doesn't matter to God what you have done. The guilt you feel in your life of all of the things that you've gone wrong. The enemy of your soul, the devil would like you to condemn you of those things. There's a lot of people around that like to throw rocks and pummel you because of those things. Jesus dealt with that. He said, you who are about sin, let him cast the first stone. The Lord loves you. Bottom line, Jesus initiated salvation before we ever were born, before we ever made our first mistake, he's already made a way to be accepted. And you are accepted today if you accept him. But you have to experience it for himself and really know what I'm telling you about. And there is a big difference. And I want to say this this morning before we close. There is a big difference between knowing Jesus and going to church. A lot of people are messed up I should call that this message you messed up. A lot of people messed up, have messed up, when they compare or qualify their relationship with God to going to church and have a relationship with God. It's not the same thing. And so there's a lot of people that are not victorious, they're not happy, they're not content. They're bored in church life because they think going to church makes them a Christian. It doesn't. I wish I could get some help in here. Anyone say amen? Yeah. 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 Or, yeah. And going to church does not make you a Christian. A lot of our children will come with us to church. We've been saved. We give our heart to God. We raise them up in church. And they never have a personal relationship with God for themselves. That's what they get bored. They get tired. They hear the messages. They've heard that before. And they never get to that place where they accept Jesus. Big mistake. Because church without God is nothing but religion. And it's dried up and will wither your soul. Now, I do want you to come to church. <laughs> because church is a vehicle that points you to Jesus. And begins to challenge you to open your heart and let him in. And so for that reason, it is important to come together as well as be in fellowship with like-minded believers in who He is. But we must have that personal relationship. We must experience Jesus for ourselves. And number three, and in closing, we must live. We must live this new life. We must live this life of living in, in an eternal state of mind. When you receive Jesus as your personal Savior, a deposit was made by God that says you are sealed for eternity. You are now walking in an e eternal purpose. Eternity should be on your mind. The blessings and favor of God have been poured out. It's a transformed way of thinking. It's transformed thinking. That's why in the book of Romans, Paul says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It's that walking in faith. We walk by faith and not by sight. It's recognizing, acknowledging God in all of our ways. That God is now involved. That His life is now in me. I live this life by the Son of God. He's now invested. He's coming to my heart to take up residence in my spirit. And I'm now walking in eternal life. In this life and in the life to come, the blessing of eternity and the favor of God is on us now. The greater is now. Can you say that? The greater is now. Listen, our lives are less linear. Where we race from the time we are born to the time we die. 
but they are more organic. They grow day by day, from experience to experience. And a lot of times, if we are not careful, and I need someone to come up with some music, if we're not careful, we plan our lives out in such a way that we set goals, we have plans, we have desires that are out here, we start calculating how long it's going to take and what we're going to do. And those things all have a place. You know, in our life, when we go to a funeral, we see on the headstone, 1944 to 2004, with a dash in between. And that little dash represents our life. And very short, isn't it? And if we're not careful, if we're not careful and recognize the organic part of our life, that our life is a daily experience. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad. It's a beautiful day. He's created a day. I want to enjoy my day. I've come to tell you today, God's created this day for you to enjoy your day. Enjoy it for Him is the ultimate experience. God created you to enjoy your life. And many of us are not enjoying our lives because we're living a life in disappointment. We've had failure take place in our lives. We've had people that have turned their backs on us and have discouraged them. Those that we thought that we could trust and count on left us and are no longer around. We've had situations where failure in business starts have taken place and we're disappointed. And life literally is continuing to grieve. And we're wondering, will I ever make anything of my life? That's a mistake, my friend. That's a mistake, brothers and sisters. That's a mistake. God's working everything out for good to those who love the Lord. And don't let the disappointments and discouragements and problems of yesterday ruin your today. Jesus created this day for you to enjoy. And He's calling you today to know Him in a closer way. If you're here this morning and you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I say with all the confidence that I know that He will make a difference in your life if you'll let Him. If you'll invite Him to come to your heart, forgive you of your sins, Wash every mistake away by His precious blood. He'll do it. And you'll leave this place different than when you came in. I guarantee it. And you'll look at your life. And you'll question in your mind and say, Why did I wait so long? That's the truth. Has anybody else had that happen to them? Sure. Sure you did. And it can happen for you. If you're here without Jesus. There's no pre-qualification. There's no test to take. There's no measuring up. I tried that. Oh, I tried to put smoking, quit cussing, quit doing all this stuff. I always messed up. And finally, I said, you know what? going to go just like I am. All my hang-ups, all my messed up life, I'm just going to go. I did. So I said, why don't you come to church? with me tomorrow. He said, okay, I'll, I'll, I will. I plan on going. They thought I was crazy. I was half drunk when I said I'd go to church. But I went. The next day, I went to church. Surprise, surprise. Came to church. Last, last bench of the church. The altars were open, and I couldn't wait to get down there. I was so messed up. But I went anyway to the altar. Was it good enough for God? Can I clue you guys in on something this morning? None of us will ever be good enough for God. Even today. He loves us. He absolutely, without condition, loves us. But we're never good enough. Oh, we're a lot better than we used to be. For sure. You guys are pretty close. Well, Pastor Jay's pretty close anyway. The rest of us, we still got work to do. We got work to do. Work on us, Lord. Work on us. He's working on it. But he says, you know, you're good.
goodness, your righteousness in his sight is as filthy rags. So how do I make it? How do I stand in the presence of a holy God accepted by him? Because Jesus is there next to the Father and says, hey, see Kim coming out of the altar? You see that one right there today coming out of the altar? Father, I put on my blood for them. And my righteousness now becomes their righteousness. And we become accepted in the beloved just as we are. So don't let anything hold you back this morning from trusting in Jesus Christ as your Savior. He loves you. Unconditionally, without doubt, will accept you today if you'll make a choice. The wonderful thing about this almighty, all knowing all loving God is that He doesn't force Himself upon us. He doesn't make us be saved. He doesn't make us receive eternal life. He just says, come if you want to, and I'll receive you here. So I'd like to ask you today to make a decision. If you're here this morning and you do not or have not except the love of God, the grace of Jesus Christ. You, you don't, you're not sure if eternal life has been imparted into your soul. And I want you to make a decision today. Would you come and find a place around this altar and kneel down and just pray with us? A simple prayer. It's so simple, it almost seems unreasonable. It seems like it's impossible that God can do it that easy. But it's as simple as saying, Jesus, come into my heart. Someone's coming right now. We need someone to help pray right here. Someone help us find this lady with prayer. Help her find the Lord. As she comes, how about you today? Very simple prayer. Lord, I believe that you died for my sins. And you rose from my life. Forgive me. And let your blood wash my sins away. Is that it? Yes. Is it that easy? Yes. There's nothing else I have to do? No. Would you stand all around this church? Would you stand with me all around this church? 